back in the fall of 1980. Veronica Kay was another typical Canadian teenager who liked to shop, go to parties, and hang out with her friends. Popular, friendly, and gifted with a sense of humor, the 18-year-old was more focused on having fun and going out, than making a list of long-term life goals and settling down. The child of divorced parents, life wasn't always easy at home. There were rules to follow and Veronica, like most teens, occasionally showed her stubborn side while trying to gain her independence. There were the usual arguments between parents and their children about staying out too late and spending far too much time with friends instead of studying. At one point, Veronica moved out of her father and stepmother's place and began living with her grandmother. In the Highway 427 and Bloor Street area of Etobicoke, in Toronto's West End. The rules were more relaxed with her nana, who would sometimes let her stay out late, providing she called to let her know where she was. On Friday, November 7, 1980, Veronica was planning to buy a few things at the Square One shopping center in Mississauga, a place that had everything a teenager could possibly want. Before going to the mall, Veronica made a quick stop at a photo lab, Cherish Photography, in a small strip plaza at 500 Hensall Circle in Mississauga. It was where her friend Elaine worked, and Veronica was there to pick up some clothes she was borrowing. Mainly a bag with a pair of jeans and two tops, for a party the next night. She left the photo lab around 1.30 p.m., telling Elaine she was getting a ride from someone who was waiting outside in his car. And that he was going to drive her to Square One to do some shopping. Veronica didn't say who the driver was, but promised to give Elaine a call later that day. Thinking nothing more of it at the time, Elaine went back to work. It would be the last time Elaine saw her friend alive. Just 18 at the time of her disappearance, Veronica Kay was going to the Square One shopping center in Mississauga when she disappeared on November 7, 1980. Her body was not found until almost a year later and whoever killed her is still on the loose. Saturday night came and went, and Veronica didn't show up to the much-anticipated party. The next day, there was still no sign of the 18-year-old. By Monday, her family was worried. Sure, staying out late, sometimes all night, was something Veronica would do but never without phoning and letting a family member know her whereabouts. By Monday November 10, her worried grandmother hadn't seen or heard from Veronica in days. So she called Toronto police to let them know her granddaughter was missing. Was it possible that Veronica was a runaway? Asked the police. Before going on, if you like these stories, do hit the like button, subscribe to my channel and turn on the notification bell so you will not miss new stories like this. It was highly unlikely, since there wasn't any good reason for her to leave her grandmother's home. She was fed and taken care of by her nana, who helped her out with a few dollars here and there. Life was good at Nana's. Veronica could come and go as she pleased, as long as she called to let her know where she was staying, and who she was chumming around with. She was also going to start a new job the very next day a part-time position at a local Mississauga pizza parlor, so running away was out of the question. Although her younger sister disappeared 30 years ago, Veronica's sister Sherilyn Lafferty still has sharp, painful memories of the day she found out Veronica was missing. At 22, Sherilyn was four years older than her sister, one of the many Ontarians who at the time were moving out west to Vancouver to find work. When her father Ron called her apartment, Sherilyn's phone had been damaged the night before and wasn't working properly. The crackling line kept cutting in and out, and she managed to convey a message to her father that she would call him back collect from a phone booth in a few minutes. She knew her younger sister was living with their grandmother, and as soon as she heard her father say, Veronica is missing, Sherilyn immediately knew her baby sister hadn't run away. But that something terrible had happened to her. My dad told me, and I remember my knees buckling, feeling nauseated, and squatting down in the phone booth just bawling my eyes out. Because I knew right then that there was something tragically wrong, 
because Veronica would have called my Nana to say she wasn't coming home. And she wouldn't have worried my grandmother like that, said Sherilyn. Just a night or two earlier, she remembered experiencing the worst nightmare she ever had in her life. Although she couldn't remember exactly what caused her to wake up, she later found out her grandmother had a similarly upsetting dream, right around the same time. I don't remember what it was about, but I woke up sobbing. And I often wonder to this day if it was some type of signal or message. Just seven weeks after her sister's disappearance, a local paper followed up with the family in the days before Christmas 1980. Accompanying the article was a photo of the four girls. Sherilyn, Veronica, Julie, and Melissa. Taken during a much happier time, the holidays the year before. At the time, their father wanted to remain optimistic but couldn't help feeling as though his missing daughter was dead. It would be more of a shock to see Veronica walk in that door Christmas morning than for the police to come and say they found her body, said Ron K. I've taken this whole situation apart and put it together again and I can't come up with any other answer except she's not alive. In the weeks following her disappearance, numerous tips came into police. But none materialized into solid evidence and Veronica was not found. After hearing the news that her sister was missing, Sherilyn came back home from Vancouver, and the family became involved in the search. Printing posters of Veronica and distributing them across Mississauga in the hope that someone, somewhere, remembered seeing her. When a loved one is missing, families will often go to any length for information. At one point, Sherilyn went to a psychic, who told her a white van was involved and that Veronica was in a wooded area in the Orangeville area of Ontario. Months passed, and there was still no sign of Veronica. Around 9.30 on the morning of October 9, 1981, almost a year after her disappearance, two men were walking a dog in a woodlot off Duffy's Lane in Caledon, Ontario, when they came across a horrific sight. Lying on the ground was a body. Still dressed, it was nearly skeletonized. And appeared to have been in the woods for some time. Police were called to the scene and the remains were taken in for forensic testing. Information was circulated across Canada and the United States, and in a few days the body of Veronica Kay was identified through her dental records. At the time she went missing in 1980, Veronica was about 5 feet 2 inches tall, 120 pounds, with shoulder-length brown hair, and a fair complexion. When she was found almost a year later, she was wearing the same clothes she'd had on when she disappeared. Which is a long-sleeve maroon shirt, red, down-filled nylon vest, blue jeans, blue socks, and brown running shoes with a white stripe. The bag holding the jeans she borrowed from her friend Elaine was missing and her purse was nowhere to be found. A forensic examination was conducted, and newspaper reports at the time stated Veronica was beaten and suffered numerous blows to the head before she died. There was no mention made if she had been sexually assaulted. Her sister, Sherilyn, remembers hearing that the back of Veronica's skull was fractured, and that one of her baby fingers was broken, as if she was trying to ward off a blow. For police, the hunt for a killer was on. For Veronica's family, the many months of uncertainty over what happened to their daughter had come to a close, but an unsatisfying one. Her remains were found but whoever killed her was still out there, free and living life. For families of murder victims, the emotions that come with the discovery of a body are often mixed. They are often grateful the remains of their loved one have been located. But many questions remained unanswered. Who killed Veronica? Was it a stranger, or someone she knew? Was there anything that could have been done to prevent this tragedy? Some questions simply cannot be answered, even after 30 years, your life is never the same, said Sherilyn. The guilt, the shame and remorse of what you could have, should have, or would have done. Even though you know intellectually those are wasted emotions, but you just can't help it. The last time Sherilyn saw her sister alive was when she flew in from Vancouver for a party in Mississauga they were both attending. She remembers Veronica telling her she loved her. Veronica was standing on the road and called out to her sister, 
and keep in touch. Even after her sister's remains were found, Sherilyn hasn't been able to feel a sense of finality about her sister's death. At Veronica's memorial, attended by her many friends and family, she remembers standing in front of the closed casket and her father telling her that Veronica wasn't there. At first, she believed the comment was made in the spiritual sense, that her soul had departed her body. The comment was actually literal. There had been a delay in returning Veronica's body to the family, and most people at the crowded memorial were unaware her coffin at the time was empty. We're at the memorial, and Veronica's remains weren't even there, said Sherilyn. They were there in time for the burial, but not in time for the memorial, so that was weird. I've never had a feeling of closure. Was Veronica the victim of a serial predator, a man who drove around Ontario picking up young women in the 70s and early 80s who were hitchhiking, and robbing them of their lives? While police are not confirming if such a person of interest exists or existed. The number of other unsolved murders and disappearances of young women in southern Ontario within a close geographic proximity cannot be ignored. In November 2009, on the 29th anniversary of Veronica's disappearance, Ontario Provincial Police announced a $50,000 reward for information leading to the arrest and conviction of the person or persons responsible for Veronica's murder. In cold cases, Witnesses sometimes feel more comfortable approaching the authorities years after the fact with information. We are confident that someone out there has the missing piece of information that will resolve this case, said Detective Inspector Andy Karski of the OPP's Criminal Investigations Branch. The passage of time, for one reason or another, may allow those people with information about the case to finally come forward and provide police with a vital clue or tip that may lead to an arrest. In 2009, the OPP also revealed another unusual item for the first time in their investigation. A small metallic button just over half an inch, 1.5 centimeters, in diameter. Police determined the button, found underneath Veronica's remains, did not come from any of her clothing. The button has several unusual characteristics. It is a clip-on, not sewn to a garment, and has a unique, slightly raised design on its face. Depending on how it is viewed, the button looks a great deal like a numeric number 8, or the symbol for infinity. It is hoped that whoever killed Veronica was wearing clothing with the button attached to it, and that this tiny piece of evidence can be used to help identify and catch a killer. We have no idea how that button got there, said Karski. We are desperate for one small break and it may come from forensics or from somebody seeing that button. Sergeant Nikki Randall from the Caledon OPP said the button was investigated years earlier, when Veronica's remains were found. There was a lot of investigation done into the button at the time. Said Randall who, along with her colleagues, is contacting a number of manufacturers and searching websites and blogs on the internet for information and photos. Randall said the OPP have received a number of tips since the photo and details about the button were released. And are hopeful for a break in the 30-year-old cold case. Although decades have passed since Veronica's murder, it still isn't known how she got from Cherish Photography in Mississauga to the woods in Caledon. Veronica and her friends did hitchhike sometimes. Did she get a ride with someone she knew or a total stranger on the afternoon of November 7, 1980? Her friend Elaine never saw the person who was apparently going to give Veronica a ride to the Square One shopping center. At the time, police believed the young woman was probably murdered while hitchhiking. Following his daughter's murder, Ron K. wrote a number of letters to the mayors of Toronto and Peel asking to have hitchhiking banned and encouraged parents to talk to their children about the dangers of thumbing a ride. Sherilyn Lafferty said her sister's remains were found with a bus transfer issued by Mississauga Transit for November 7, the same day she went missing. She had a bus transfer, so that's what makes me want to think it may have been somebody who drove by and saw her and said, I'll give you a ride. Somebody she knew, or the bus was taking too long and she thought. If I don't get a ride, I'll jump on the bus. 
While it is possible that police will garner leads from members of the public who have seen news items in the papers or on television, or official information posted on the Ontario Provincial Police website. The Internet has become a place where armchair sleuths have posted their unsubstantiated theories about who murdered Veronica on various websites and blogs. One individual went so far as to actually name a suspect, who is now deceased. Much of the information and specific details that these self-styled detectives post online may seem convincing. But it's not gained through first-hand knowledge. They're just going on old newspaper and magazine articles written about the crime. Such theories would be beneficial, if they were true. When police are sent to investigate they often turn out to be fabrications or outright lies. Perpetrated by individuals who are often mentally unstable, addicted to drugs or alcohol, or who have unresolved issues with their parents, or a close relative and invent false allegations to get back at them. For police and the families of murder victims, these hoaxes are not only disruptive, they can be emotionally devastating. Unfounded online theories not only waste time for the police who investigate them to see if they have any validity, but resurrect painful feelings for family members who are forced to relive the death of their loved ones through the eyes of a stranger. In Veronica's case, at least one individual who went so far as to create and post videos online of the search for evidence and bodies years after the murder had contacted the family directly, giving them false hope about bringing Veronica's killer or killers to justice. After 30 years, police believe there may be someone out there able to solve the mystery of who killed Veronica K. Even after all these years, it is possible that a tiny piece of evidence the size of a button will finally bring a killer to justice.